Just uh, bow our heads for prayer for a moment. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all these folks. I thank you that you love them and you've brought them here, Lord, and you're going to feed them with your word, Lord, and they're going to walk out here filled, Lord, not just with words, Lord, but with new inspiration to do your will on this earth, Lord. They're going to go out here with, uh, with hope, with faith, with joy, and with a purpose, Father. And we just thank you for what you're about to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen. All right, so this is part four of my series which is called Moved, Stirred, and Compelled. And we've recently been talking about the God-given inner drive that should be in every believer that causes us to be motivated to do something, that causes us to not be able to just sit in a pew and be satisfied, but to actually have a desire in our heart to go and to do the things of God. If you're alive, you have a heart that drives you in some direction in your life. Everyone has desires. Every one of us has something within our heart that motivates us to do the things we do and to love the things that we love. But not everyone has the heart of God. The heart of God that beats within everyone who is born again of the Spirit is something that God wants us to have part of. He wants us to join our heart to his heart, to have our heart synchronized to his heart so that the things that mean something to him mean something to us. Amen. And the things that are unimportant to him are unimportant to us. Our father wants us to have his heart. Those things that he considers important in this world, do you know what they all revolve around? The motivation for them all is love. But you know what they all revolve around, really? Everything he's created, this whole thing we're looking at? Man. You know that? Man. That's the creation that it all revolves around. Do you realize we're the only creation, the only creation out of all the millions of things he's created, the only creation that's created in his image and likeness? Not even angels can claim that. Just you and I. The only one that was created for eternal fellowship personally with him. Man is the only creation that was important enough to God that when man fell, he manifested himself in flesh and died on a cross. Do you know the angels fell too, right? There was no salvation for them. But for us, he sent his son. For us, he said, I love them so much. The apple of my eye, the crowning glory of my creation, the one who's created in my image and likeness. I love them so much, I cannot let them perish. And you know, it wasn't just some rescue mission that he had to come up with a plan last minute. Like, oh my God, man's fallen, I've got to do something. Before he created us, he knew the mess we would be. Yeah. He knew the mess you and I would be. Yeah. And he created us anyway. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people who get married, and the marriage doesn't work out, and they say, if I'd only known what you were really like before, I probably would have never gotten into this thing. Right? Boy, if I had only known how you were going to turn out, I wouldn't have married you. That's the thought. Right? But God knew exactly how you'd turn out. Every one of us. Even those that turned against him. And he made us anyway. Because he loves us. He loves us beyond our faults. What was the motivation for God to create man in the first place? It was love. It's always love with God. What motivated God to send his son to die for the sake of all that were lost? It was love. Everything God does is motivated by love. God is moved. God is stirred. God is compelled to take action for one singular purpose. Love. Love. It's not for the money. It's for the love. It's not for the glory, it's for the love. It's not for the fame, it's for the love. It's easy for us to think of God as some kind of an alien life form. He's so vastly different from us. We cannot even approach his throne. He's so different from us. We can't possibly relate to him. We're just like grasshoppers, and he's this magnificent being that is so much more intelligent than us and so much greater than us. We can never even approach to him or become like him. But God says, actually, I created you to be like me. What? Something went wrong. 
Yes, I created you in my own image and likeness, and actually you're supposed to resemble me. Do you know, I've seen people who thought they were good artists that weren't that good. And they draw, oh, watch, I'm drawing a sketch of so-and-so, and they've drawn this profile sketch. And Who is that? And I go, um, I don't know. I don't know. Is that, like, is that Fred Flintstone? <laughs> no, it's you. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't see any resemblance whatsoever. The thing that you created was not really, in my opinion, in my image and likeness, so I didn't see it, right? Well, you know what? We do that. We look at people and we go, I don't see God in them. I don't see God's image. I don't see God's likeness. It's like, you look nothing like God. You know what? We are the children of God. We should begin to look like our Father. Yeah. We should resemble our Father. Our spiritual DNA is from God himself. We're the only ones created in his image and likeness, nobody else. You know what? I don't expect an angel to look like God, but I expect that God's sons should look like their father. Don't you think? We are called God's offspring. God created us to be like him, and he didn't create us to be unlike him, but to be like him. In every part where we are not like him, we're simply showing evidence of the corruption that occurred when we sinned. We are said to be God's offspring. We are said to be God's image bearers and those who have been created in his image and likeness. It's easier for us, though, to believe that we're vastly different than God. Because if we're vastly different than God, then we don't have to put an expectation for ourselves upon ourselves to live up to who we're supposed to be. Well, he's so much farther above us, we're just dirt down below, and we could never be like him. He's saying, actually, I made you to be like me. No, no, that's, that's a pretty high goal. Yes, actually, I made you to be in my image and likeness. Actually, I made you to be able to relate to me. I made you to be able to understand my heart. I made you to be uh, created in such a way that you would resemble me and reflect me to others when they see you. No, 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 God, you're an alien. You're way different. We'll never be like you. He says, that's not the way I created you. If we are like him... We are not focusing necessarily on the physical attributes, but on the real person that lives on the inside. That's what we're talking about. The Bible talks about the hidden man of the heart. Yeah. The hidden man of the heart. You know what? You, you say, I, here I am. This is what I look like. That's what you look like on the outside. But what do you look like on the inside? There is a person on the inside. When your natural body dies, your spirit doesn't die. Doesn't. Continues to exist. Because that's the real you. And the real you, what does that person look like? What does that person look like? That's the hidden man of the heart. That's the one God created in his image and likeness. The Bible calls the true person that's inside us the inner man. He's hidden because he's in the spirit and God is spirit and we are spirit. And we are a spirit that is roaming around at this present time in a vessel or a body. And our inner man, if we're born again, is born from above and God is our father. Our inner man <coughs> excuse me, is eternal and shall never die. Our outer man, on the other hand, is earthly and is simply in a temporary housing. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, though... Outwardly, we are wasting away, yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. Do you know the inner, inward man doesn't age, but he actually gets better with age? He's renewed day by day. He becomes more and more like his father. When we will begin to confess the truth, and the truth is what the Bible says, and believe the truth of what the Bible says, then the truth will be able to begin to manifest in our lives. We must begin to acknowledge who we really are because of what God has said. Not who you say you are, but who you really are. <clears throat> we need to acknowledge what we really are, according to God. We need to acknowledge whose we really are, according to the Word of God. When we begin to look at God as our Father and not some strange alien being, then we can begin to walk in the reality that He made us to be like Him. He has shared his image with us, his likeness with us, and we should begin to share his heart and his desires as well. People should look at you and I, <clears throat> and people should say, like father, like son. Amen. You know that? Do they say that? When we allow the heart of God to synchronize our heart with his heart, 
His desires become our desires. What He wants becomes what we want. His joys become our joys. The Bible says this, It is God that works in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. You know what? When we let God work in us, He puts a will in us. And it's both to will, to desire what He desires, and to do what He desires us to do. That's what the Bible says if we allow Him to work in us. We're waiting sometimes for some big change in our lives. And you know, the big change came when you got born again. The big change came when the Holy Spirit moved in. When the Holy Spirit moved in, guess what? You've got all the equipment necessary now. All you've got to do is turn to Him. All you've got to do is allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. The Holy Spirit's in you. He might be in a closet. He might be locked in that closet. But He's in you. And He's waiting to come out. He's waiting for you to allow him to invade every aspect of your life, including your heart, your mind, your soul. We simply need to... Okay. I don't know what's going on. I I didn't move. So, are we okay now? Is it? Oh, okay. We'll just leave leave it where it's at. We'll try it one more time. Forgive us for that. <clears throat> okay, so we simply need to open ourselves up to the love that God has already placed inside us. Do you know the Bible says this? It says, for the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That means the Holy Spirit's in you, shedding abroad God's love in you. The question is this, is the jar sealed so that that can't come out? Or is that coming out? Because God would like his love to flow from him through your heart to this world. God wants to show the world who he is through us, through his children. Um, Romans 5, 5 says this, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. You know, the Holy Ghost is already inside us. God's love is in us. We need to acknowledge that his love is inside us. And because until you recognize and acknowledge it's there, you're not going to manifest it. You've got to say, God said it's there, so it's there. I will begin to allow God to love people through me. Philippians 1.6 says this, And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. He didn't say all the good things we could receive from Christ. He says we already have them. We have to acknowledge every good thing that is in us through Christ Jesus. We have to say, you know what? I don't need to wait for some day for me to be changed. I actually need to allow the Holy Spirit to be who he is through me right now. I need to let him live through my life. What is it that motivated the the apostles to completely sell out everything they had and leave everything that made them feel safe and comfortable and live lives of extreme peril at personal cost just to preach the gospel? What, What was that motivation? You could say, well, it was the Holy Ghost that drove them to do that. You know what? That's not a motivation, that's a motivator. The Holy Ghost is the motivator, but the motivation always has to go back to the same place. It's the love of God that was in their hearts. The motivation is the same thing that caused Jesus to die on the cross. They caused Paul to risk his life and his freedom. They caused Peter to give up his family business and preach to the very Jews that killed Jesus. Think about that. The apostles had a job preaching to the very people that killed Jesus. Now, can you imagine us? So one, one person said this after first service. They said, wow, I've never seen it that way. They said, that's kind of like us preaching to ISIS. You know, that kind of, that's what it's like. They just killed Jesus, and now we're going to preach to them. There's salvation in Jesus. Mind-blowing, isn't it? It is mind-blowing because it doesn't come from the mind. It comes from the heart of God. That motivation is love. But let's be even more specific. It's the love of God. The love of God that was in them, that was manifest through them by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what do you suppose should motivate you and I? Should God's love motivate us? If God's love did motivate us, what do you suppose that would look like? What do you suppose it would look like if we actually let God motivate our hearts to do what he wanted us to do? We go, oh, oh, well, then I'd have to step out of the way, wouldn't I? then I'd have to allow him to have his will instead of me, wouldn't I? Yes, exactly. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. He wants to use us in this world to reach this world so that this world can be reconciled to him just like you and I were. To save the lost. He wants us to have his heart so we actually care about the lost so much that we can't be okay just sitting in a pew on Sunday. We can't be okay with that. That's not enough. 
It's not enough. There's people that's lost. There's people being lost every single day. There's people that are dying every single day without Christ. And some of them, perhaps we could talk to. Somebody talked to me. Somebody took a chance to talk to me. I'm glad they did. Not all of us were brought up in church. I wasn't brought up in church. I had to have somebody from church to come outside the church and talk to me outside of church. You know that? The love of God is to become the motivation behind everything we think, everything we speak, and every action we take. 1 Corinthians 9.16 says this, Yet the preaching of the good news is not something I can boast about, Paul speaking. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible it is for me if I didn't preach the good news. Paul is saying, the good news that I preach is because the power of God compels me so strongly that I cannot help myself but to do it. I have to do it. In the Old Testament, one of the prophets said, it's like a fire that's shut up in my bones, you know? I can't contain this. I can't contain this. If I can contain it, it's telling me something. I don't have God's heart. Because God's heart will not allow us to sit by and watch the world be lost. Now you might go, uh oh, now I'm feeling convicted. So, the, so if the purpose was of the sermon was to make you feel guilty or convicted, then I would have accomplished my goal. But that's not my goal. My goal is to get us to do something. To get us to say, oh, now I feel guilty. Okay, Lord, I'm sorry. But actually to get us to say, you know what? I want to do something. I want to step out. I want to please God in everything that I do. I want to be used of God everywhere I go. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. The love of God should compel us. That means it motivates us to do something. Not motivates us just to have an emotion. Oh, I feel bad about those lost people. Well, okay, I'm over it. But motivates us to do something. Now, did the love of God, can you imagine the love of God for us if he looked down upon us from heaven and he said, I really love them. I really feel bad for them. I feel bad they're all lost. I feel bad they're going to hell. Oh, well. But you know what? The love of God had him look down upon us and say, I cannot let that happen. I have to do something. Here's what the Bible says, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, it was his love that motivated him, that he gave. He gave. He had to do something. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He says, he says I loved you so much I couldn't just sit up here and do nothing. I had to do something. I sent my son. And it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He says, I cannot sit by and watch you perish. Why? Because the love that's in me propels me. It motivates me. It causes me to not be able to stand by idly. I have to do something. Now, what is the love of God doing in you? What is the God, love of God in you making you do? That you say, I cannot sit still. You might go, hmm, I'll have to think about that. That's the problem right there. We have to think about it. Because you know what? We should be able to answer it like that. The love of God is so uh, evident and strong in my life that I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this because I'm on God's team and my desire is to do what God desires, which is to reconcile the loss to him. But many of us go, I don't know what I'm doing. Many of us are trophies and we're in the trophy case, church, and we get church and we get polished and we go home, sit on a shelf again. God wants us to be tools in his hands. He wants us to be him, his hand extended to this world. He wants to save the lost, and he's motivating us by his love if we allow the love of Christ in our hearts to, to be shed abroad in our hearts. If we don't lock God in a closet and let him be who he wants to be in us, we're going to be motivated that we have to do something. Now, Christine McGovern, okay, she's not here right now. She straightened me out because I said, I said, that's so nice that you're doing this knitting. She goes, that's not knitting. I didn't know there's a difference. Crocheting. Okay, you crochet. Now, here's what she does is she has put together a team of women. Well, I, maybe one of them is mad, I don't know. But anyway, 10 people. And they're all crocheting gloves for homeless people. So here's the deal, is this woman is sitting and she's seeing people that are suffering in some degree, and she says, the love of God says to me, I can't sit still, I have to do something. Well, what can you do? Um, I can crochet. 
Oh, well, you can't use that for God. Oh, yes, you can. Whatever we have, we can use for God. Whatever we have, we can use to God's glory. And she's reaching people, and people are going to... Now there's going to be dozens and dozens and dozens of people receiving these gloves, these homeless folks, saying, somebody cared. Why would they care about me? Because the love of God compelled them. The love of God doesn't let you sit still. The love of God makes you get up out of your seat and do something. God made us in his image and likeness. God's word, speak, word speaks about us as trees. It talks about that we're trees of righteousness. And if we're trees of righteousness, don't you know we're not ornamental trees? We're actually trees that bear fruit. And what kind of fruit should you find on a tree of righteousness? You'll go, well, righteous fruit. Well, let me be a little more specific. The love of God should be evidence. So much so that those that look from the outside looking towards us can see it on us. They can say, you know what? They're different. That person, love, just is exuded through that person. Everywhere that person goes, love is a thing that I see. I can notice it. It's a fruit that hangs on the outside that everyone can notice. Because the love of God in us, we're allowing it to come out. Do you know that all the laws of God are summed up in one thing? Love. To love your neighbor, to love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws of God are summed up in love. Do you know um, that all the fruits of the Spirit can be traced back to love? If you got love, you got all those other fruits. Do you realize that? Do you realize the root of who God really is is this? God says about himself, God is love. God is love. Love is not necessarily something we have to strive for and hope someday we'll get it. We have to recognize that the Holy Spirit's in us, the one that has all the love that is even possible, and we have to allow him to be himself through us, through us, Christ through us. Christ wants to work through us to reconcile the world unto himself. But we have to be willing. How can we get willing? Well, you know what? If you get the heart of God, you're willing. Because if you begin to allow God's love to really manifest in your life, you'll begin to love what he loves. And nobody will have to convince you to do anything because you'll have to do it because the love in you motivates it. People have children they love so much and it motivates them to go to work, to pay the bills, to, to support the child so they can have a house and put clothes on them. Why? Because they love. Oh, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, but they love. They can't help themselves. Right? Love will make you do all kinds of things. And love doesn't make you do it. It's a motivation. I mean, you make a decision. But you know what? When the love is so strong within you, your decision is always going to be, I have to. I have to do what is going to be of the benefit for the one that I love. You aren't just loved, but you're called to love others. John 13, 35, 34 and 35 says this, A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So also you must love one another. Did you, did you hear what that just said? It just said it in possibility. It says, love one another as I have loved you. you. Wait, wait, wait. You mean my love's got to be on the same level as God's love? Oh, what, that's impossible. His love is so much farther above our love. Well, then he just lied to you. Because when he tells you to do it, it, it it's got to be uh, expected that we can do it. Otherwise, he wouldn't tell us to do it, right? It wouldn't be fair for him to tell us to do something we couldn't do, would it? But it says that we're supposed to love one another just as God loves us. Right? By this, men will know that you're my disciples. How are you going to know? Because of your love. You know what? When you go outside this church, do people see love when they look at you? Do they see love when they look at you? Or do they see some grumpy person, some grouchy person, some complaining person? Or do they see some, some uh, person that is completely carnal and some person that are all about money? They're all about their success. They're all about their stuff. What do they see? Well, what they should see is an evidence that you are resembling your father that what is upon you is the love of God. That when they think of you, they say, you know what, you can't get to know that person without understanding that God is in them and God works through them and God loves people through that person. He said, but I can't do that. God says, you can do that. He says, I wouldn't command you to love people like I love them unless you could do it. How can I do that? Because the Holy Spirit is in you and through Christ you can do all things. But I don't know how to do that. You know what, you need to... Open yourself up to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will work to will and to do God's good pleasure within you. The reason God sent His Son is because He loved the world. Now, if God loved the world so much that He sent His Son, ask yourself a question. You're going to find out if you have the heart of God. What's your feeling toward the world? 
Oh, that's different. That's God so loved the world. I didn't love him. He did. God sent his son. I'm not doing nothing. Well, God says you're supposed to have my heart. Ooh. If God hates sin, what's your feeling towards sin? Why does God hate sin so much? His motivation is always love. God hates sin so much for a very simple reason. Sin separates us from him. And he loves us so much he doesn't want anything to separate us. It's all about love. God is against everything and he hates everything that is contrary to love. God hates sin because it causes separation. The reason God does not want us to sin is not because he's bossy. And not, it's not because he wants to just dominate over us. It's because he doesn't want anything to come between us and him. We are called to love as he loves. Here's another question for you. Did he love the sinner? Yeah. Did he love the sinner? Do you know there are people, some of them are in Florida sometimes, and they carry around a sign that says, for example, God hates gays. No, he well, that's what somebody said, but God didn't say it. Yeah, God didn't well, why, do he, why does God hate gays? Because they're sinners. Oh, okay. Then he hates all sinners, right? No, he just hates gay sinners. No, he, he hates all sinners. Really? Is that what he said in his word? No. Mm, here's what he says in his word, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, he loved us enough to die for us. Because he loved us. So according to that verse, um, he loved the sinner long before they became a saint, didn't he? How are we doing in that area? Are we loving the sinner? Are we bearing the same fruit? We have heard it said, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. That sounds good. God loves, hates, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. That's true. But some of us love the sin and hate the sinner. Some of us hate the sin and the sinner. We hate them all. But we are God's own children, and we are made in his image and in his likeness. And how come we're okay with being different than our father? Because he's not okay with it. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to represent him. He wants people to look at us and get a clear picture of who Christ is because of us. God is not okay with his children looking like the milkman. He wants us to look like him. He wants us to be the spitting image of our father. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says this, But just as, we, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be ye holy because I am holy. Do you know what? God says to us, be holy. That's an impossibility if you're an Old Testament person. But you know what? It's not impossible for us. That's why he tells us to do it. How can we possibly be holy? Because you have the Holy Spirit in you. And the Holy Spirit makes you holy. Amen. All you got to do is begin to yield to him. He says, be holy because you can be. And be holy because I'm holy. And I want people to see me when they look at you. Right? Because you're my child. It's the love of God that compels us. If we have God's heart, we should be able to feel the things that God feels. When we disagree with God, we're calling God a liar. So we need to begin to line our theology up with what the Word of God says. Because how much of our theology excuses us to live or to act differently than our Father because we say, well, He's so different? How much of our theology excuses us to say, well, we'll never be like that. We could never achieve that. We could never approach to being that good. We couldn't be holy. We could, you know, that's giving an excuse because God says, yes, you can be holy. That's why I told you to be holy. How can we possibly be holy? We're just sinners. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not sinners anymore. You're saints. You've been saved and sanctified by God. You've been filled with his Holy Spirit, and his Holy Spirit is within you. Okay? I can't be holy. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Here's what God says about that said this to uh, Peter. He says, the voice spoke to Peter, said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. You know what? I'm just a low-down sinner. God says, wait a minute, I made you clean. Stop calling yourself a no-good sinner. You're a saint saved by grace. In the Old Testament, when the temple had become defiled because of idolatry, God would not manifest his presence in the temple when they were serving idols. In 1 Chronicles or 2 Chronicles 29, King Hezekiah begins to reign. He took over after King, ah uh, King Ahaz. King Ahaz served idols. 
King Hezekiah wanted to straighten all that out. So first thing he did was he got the priests together. He says, you guys, we've got to rededicate ourselves to the Lord. You've got to go back to the temple. You've got to rebuild the temple. You've got to cleanse the temple and make it holy so the Spirit of God can come back in this place. Right? So he appointed the priest to do that, and the priest had to do that. The priest had to cleanse the temple. The temple was made with man's hands. Men, priests, had to go in there and do certain cleansing procedures. But guess what? You're not made with man's hands. But here's what the Bible says about you. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? Do you know if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, do you know what that means? See, the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit wouldn't manifest in the temple because the temple was unclean. You had to cleanse it. But once it was cleansed and dedicated to the Lord, the Holy Spirit could show up, the Shekinah glory of God. Do you realize the Holy Spirit's in you? That means God has made you clean. Because where the Holy Spirit is, he makes it holy. The high priest himself was Jesus Christ. He's the one who entered into your temple and cleansed you. He's the one who made your temple holy so the Holy Spirit could be in you. Now you have the Holy Spirit in you, so stop calling yourself, you know, a den of iniquity. You're God's, you're God's house. In the, in, the, in the New Testament, the only priest qualified to cleanse this temple was Jesus Christ. Hebrews 5, 5 and 6 says this, In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but said to him, You are my son. God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Christ was called a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And here's what it says about him in Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus names him the Son of God, let us hold firmly to our profession of faith. Do you realize that the high priest, Jesus Christ, has come into you and he's cleansed your temple and you're now called holy. That's why God says, be holy, because I made you that way. Be who I made you to be. But I'm trying. You don't have to try, you have to be it. You have to just allow me to be me in you. When God says be holy, he isn't asking you to try to be holy. He's, a, he's asking you to allow yourself to manifest his holiness. You don't cleanse the temple, he cleanses the temple. Once he's cleansed it, you don't call it unclean because he calls it clean. Hebrews 2.11 says this, Both the one who makes the people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Do you realize Jesus calls us brothers and sisters because he has made us holy and we are like him? If you think you're a low-down, no-good sinner, far from God, then you're going to act that way because you're going to act like what you believe you are. You need to begin to take on the new man that Christ created you to be. He has provided us with everything we need to be able to manifest this hidden man on the inside, the man of Christ inside us, to the outside world. See, a lot of us think we just get Christ in us and then we just, you know, he's in us. Nobody can see it. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way it's supposed to be. God is in you. He wants to manifest on the outside as well, in your life, in your actions, in your thoughts. He's provided everything we need so that we can manifest the person of God. Ephesians 4, 24, or 22 through 24 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life. It's supposed to be former. It's not supposed to be present. That you put off the old self. We're supposed to put it off which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be, you know what? What were you created to be like? Well, we're not like God. We can't be anything like God. He's so far above us. And he says, wait, well, hold on, hold on. So what's scripture say? You created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, that can't be talking about human beings. It is. God created you to be like him. God created you to have fellowship with him. He created you to be your ch his children and to have his spiritual DNA. Yeah. He created us to be holy. He created us to be like him. He created us to be image bearers of God. He created us to be such image bearers <coughs> that when people look at us, they see Jesus. That's how it's supposed to be. But a lot of us are okay if that doesn't happen. Why? Because we don't have God's heart as far as the motivation goes. You see, we can say, I'd like to be that. Now I remember hearing a preacher say one time, to this concert pianist, he brought the pianist up after this, playing this beautiful rendition of whatever it was, you know, Amazing Grace or something. He brought him up and he said, well, brother, he goes, that was so magnificent. He said, I'd give anything to be able to play like you play. And you know what the 
pianist said? He said, no, you wouldn't. What, what do you mean? He says, do you realize how many hours a day I've put in? How many years I've put in? Are you willing to do that to get this? Well, maybe not. You know what? We'd say, oh, I wish I could be holy. I wish I could be this. I wish I could be that. You know what? It takes some work. You've got to put off the old self, and you've got to start doing it as a regular thing so it becomes a lifestyle and you got to start letting God manifest himself through you because he wants to you go but I'm shy well your shyness is blocking God sometimes but that's uncomfortable you know what it was uncomfortable for Jesus to come down and die on a cross Do you know what Jesus did not like dying on a cross it says he despised the shame of the cross but he did it he stepped outside of his comfort zone why because it benefited us but we can't step outside our comfort zone because we might get embarrassed Really? We might get embarrassed. You know what? If you knew it was your last day on earth, if you knew it, and God says, I want you to go and tell everybody you love about Jesus, you, you wouldn't think twice. I don't even care if I'm embarrassed. I couldn't care less if I get embarrassed. I'm going to do it, wouldn't you? But why don't we? Well, we're embarrassed. How embarrassed will we be if someone isn't there because we were too embarrassed to tell them. And in heaven, don't you know you could have told them? That neighbor of yours, you could have told them? That person you work with, you could have told them? We see the love of God compels us. We must do something. The love of God doesn't compel you to sit down. It compels you to do something, to do the things which are at the heart of God. And at the heart of God is the salvation of souls. At the heart of God is the building of his kingdom and bringing people into reconciliation with him. That's at God's heart. That's what he wants. The thing that's in you right now that's fighting what I'm saying is your flesh. Your flesh goes, no, no, that's too uncomfortable. I just want to come to church and get polished. That's the old man talking. As long as your philosophy is, well, I'm, I can't do that. I'm just a low-down sinner. I can never become like my Heavenly Father. Then what you're really doing is giving yourself a valid excuse for not trying. You're saying, God knows I can't change, and He understands that about me, so why should I fight it? Actually, He knows different. You can change. God knows that you are a new creation. God knows that He has cleansed you Himself and made you holy. And He has put His Holy Spirit inside you so that you are able to do everything He asks you to do through Christ so that you can manifest his glory to the world just as Christ did, so that you can show his goodness and his holiness and his unfathomable love to everybody around you. God made you able to do that because he wants you to. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He came into the world by way of Mary's womb. Now the whole world is waiting for another manifestation. You see, the, the Old Testament, they were all waiting for the manifestation of the Messiah. The Messiah is going to show up someday. Well, he's shown up. He's Jesus. And now the world's waiting for another manifestation. Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know what? Sons of God, we need to manifest. Manifest means make visible. We need to make visible that God is our Father that we are in his image and likeness, that we have his heart, and the thing that motivates us to do everything we do is the love of God. That we look at this sinner and say, I'm not okay with you going to hell. I'm not okay with that. When we allow God who lives inside us to live through us, he demonstrates his heart to the world around us. It is the Spirit of God in us that desires to move us, to stir us, to compel us to do the will of the Father. Either you've been called to manifest as a son of God to this world, or your calling is to manifest as a lost son of Adam. Which are you? Are you a son of God or a lost son of Adam? Which are you? So I could guilt you into doing something. But I don't need to guilt you to do anything if I can just get you to open up your heart to God's heart. Because once you have his heart, you want to do the things of God. You have a burden upon you to do the things of God. You want to yourself. Nobody needs to push you. Nobody needs to kick you in the butt. Nobody at all because the love of God compels you so much you have to do something. And that's what God wants for all of us. He wants us to say, I'm not comfortable anymore doing nothing. I'm not okay with being a Christian that sits on a shelf like a polished trophy. I'm not okay with that. I have to do something because the love of God compels me. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. I can't sit still. That's what God wants for us. Dead people don't move, but living people should be moving. 
and the motivation that moves us is the love of God, the heartbeat of God. All right, we're going to stop there. And I'm going to ask this question. If there's anybody here today who has never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and to save you, to wash away your sins, then you are lost, hopelessly lost, but not hopelessly, because Jesus made a way for everybody, even if you feel hopeless, for everybody, whosoever will, he said, let them come. And Jesus will receive you and Jesus will cleanse you and Jesus will make you a child of God because he loves you. If you have never received him, you need this salvation more than you need anything else. And you don't have to wait another minute. And God's not withholding it from you. He's offering it to everybody. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, I'm asking you to raise your hand so we can pray with you today and you can change all that. And you can become a son or a daughter of God today. If there's anybody here, Step out of your comfort zone if you've never done this and say, I just need to do this. Anybody at all, raise your hand. Anybody at all. All right, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. But I don't just thank you for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Because your Holy Spirit abides within us, lives within us, and gives us, Lord, your hearts. And Lord, we want to allow right now, we want to say to our heart, step aside. Holy Spirit, we allow you to invade our will, our emotions, our soul in such a way that we can be in tuned with your very spirit, God. That we can be in tuned with the things that you love. That we can hate the things that you hate. That we can pursue the desires that you have. That we can be examples on this earth of Christ in his hand extended. Right now, Father, all of our selfish motives, all of our ungodly motives, we want to say we set those aside right now. And we see, Lord, if we've never said it before, we say it now. Let your will be done in our lives that you might be glorified. And we thank you for what you're doing right now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Don't forget. Don't forget about Wednesday night. If you haven't been, come this time, all right? God bless you.